Well, State Farm Arena has become the largest voting facility in Georgia. And who better to talk about the importance of voting in Georgia and voter suppression? Let's bring in Stacey Abrams, who served in the Georgia House of Representatives for 11 years overall. Stacey, I know voter suppression is uh, something that is near and dear to you. There are so many people now joining in that movement, but I want to make it plain for our viewers. Talk to me about how simply would you say or describe, rather, what voter suppression looks like? Voter suppression, first of all, Carrie, thank you for having me. Voter suppression is any attempt by those in power to prevent or discourage you from casting your ballot. And they do that in three ways. By limiting your ability to register or stay on the rolls, by limiting your ability to cast a ballot, and by limiting the ability for your ballot to be counted. It looks different depending on the state you're in, but that, those three points are exactly what happens in every state that practices voter suppression. Stacey Abrams, this is Dwayne Wade. Uh, first, I just want to say that my wife, Gabrielle Union, and I are big supporters and huge fans of yours. Um, my question to you will be about the U.S. Postal Service. And can you talk to us about the importance of keeping our U.S. Postal Service, and especially in, you know, especially in the black communities? Absolutely. So let's start with the fact that in the midst of a pandemic, voting by mail is the safest way to cast your ballot if you can use it. Yep. 34 states allow everyone to vote by mail. There are 16 states that put limits on it, but every state has the capacity. And we know, unfortunately, that this current administration is doing their best to limit access to vote by mail. Mm -hmm. Not because it leads to fraud, in fact, it doesn't, but because it actually leads to expanded participation in the process of voting. And so one of the strategies they're using is to defund the U.S. Postal Service. We know that not only have they tried to slow the, the monies going to the Postal Service, we also know that the Postal Service has been crippled by the pandemic. People aren't using large mailings anymore. And so they are facing an economic crisis that the Trump administration is refusing to answer. And so there's a bill that passed the House that's sitting in front of the Senate. It will allocate $10 billion dollars to shore up the U.S. Postal Service. That is essential for the right to vote, but it also is critical to the economy. As you pointed out, for the black community, the black middle class especially was built by be people being able to work for the U.S. Postal Service, one of the only governmental offices where discrimination was not permitted and where that lack of discrimination meant that people were able to build strong families, strong communities, and it continues to be one of the number one employers of African Americans who make it into the middle class. And so this is not just about making sure we can vote. It's also about connecting communities and protecting the black community. And the last thing I'll say is this. A lot of folks live in rural communities. A third of Georgia's rural community is African-American. If you look around the country, there are a lot of people of color who live in rural communities. In those spaces, the post office is more than where you get your mail. Mm. The postal service is how you get your medicine, how you get your food, and how you stay connected to the world. <coughs> Stacy Draymond Green here. Um... First off, I want to say thank you for everything you've done over the years as far as voting goes. I can shamefully say I have not voted since 2008. And the reason I was so excited to vote in 2008 because someone with the skin color of, my, of myself, a uh, black man, Barack Obama, was running for president. And as a kid growing up in the neighborhood, I never thought I'd see the day a black man would even be on the ballot for presidency. And so that was exciting for me. But I want to ask you a question. So we just watched a piece uh, from Coach Pierce of the Atlanta Hawks, and he said one of the reasons he think a lot of people don't get out and vote, because there's not a lot of people like yourself that look like you or myself in those positions. And so it deter our young African Americans away. Do you think that is the case? And if so, what more can we do to help change that? Representation matters. You believe what's possible in part because of your internal capacity, but often it's because of what you see. When I ran for governor of Georgia, I became the first black woman in the history of the mm -hmm. United States to ever be the nominee for a major party. Mm. But that, what that meant was that I had to make it up as I went along. I couldn't look to anyone to even say, this is how I get here, because no one had done it before. And if you live in a community where you are told over and over again what you are not, it is hard to imagine what you can be. And so despite being challenged by some and chastised by others, I always talked about what it meant to be a black woman running for that office because mm. I needed young black women, young black girls, young black people to believe that they were capable of more than what they always saw around them. 
and then this conversation that we're having nationally about the future of the country, yes, it matters to say what we think we're capable of and what we want. What, one of the reasons I'm so excited about this work and this conversation, I believe in voting not just because you get to cast a ballot. I believe in the power of voting, the power to say this is who I want to see speaking for me. When you live in a representative democracy, which is where we live, then the whole point is picking someone who can represent you. And how can they represent you fully if there's no one who understands what you've lived through? I don't chastise those who don't, who don't vote. I want to encourage them to do so because it is their power. And the way we change the future is by participating in it, not by simply being angry about it or worse, being convinced that it doesn't matter. And so I, 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 I hope that you're going to be voting in 2020. But what I hope even more is that when you vote in 2020, you do so not simply because of what you see, but because of what you want to encourage other people to imagine they can see as well. Absolutely. Stacey, let me ask you this question. Watching TV every day, I am disgusted by both parties fighting like cats and dogs over every subject. How can you give me some hope because it's been like this. It's not just happening now. It's happened for many, many years. Why is we as the American public have any faith in the political system if the Democrats and the Republicans are going to disagree on every subject and don't look out for, for people? So I, I, I want to begin by saying that politics has been polarized since King David. <laughs> we, there's always been people on either side people who want power, people who have power, people who don't want to share power. And so our responsibility is to pick the people who are willing to compromise to make that power work for as many people as possible. When I was the leader of the Democrats in Georgia, I was always in the minority. I used to joke that my title, minority leader, was Latin for lose well. But my job was <laughs> to find places to work with the Republicans to get things done. But the challenge was that I was often held accountable, not simply for the work we accomplished, I was challenged because I bothered to speak to them. Americans have a responsibility to encourage us to work together, to not celebrate those who pick fights, but to celebrate those who pick solutions. But that has to come from the outside in. If you only elect people who tell you how they're going to hate the other side, then you can't be surprised when all they do is fight with the other side. We can get there, but it's not just about who we elect, it's how we elect and how we hold people accountable for serving our interest instead of serving their own. Stacey, like you sit here and you are talking to all of us and it's a true education. And this is more of a comment than a question. But when you lost the election, you refused to use the word concede because you said that wasn't actually true. Uh, you said the now governor was an active participant, maybe the architect of voter suppression, and you knew that instead of fighting the battle of trying to win the actual election in the legal system, that you could do better. And I want folks at home who are watching to know that voter suppression is important, but most important is to vote, because if people got out to vote for you, you would be the governor of Georgia. Uh, I am looking forward to basically hearing, perhaps, that you might be the vice president. Do you want to announce that here? You can. <laughs> I, I, have you... I have no power to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> who says? I, who says, Stacey? Who says? <laughs> King Charles might, but that is not a power I possess. So. Okay, all right. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us. I have a, I have a little something here for the fellas. I want to tell them this. They may not know. Uh, Stacy, you not only are you a New York Times best-selling author, but you write romance novels, correct? I do. Can I, Kara, can I ask for one moment of privilege, just a quick Take thing? Take all your plug? time, yes. We have, so one thing I, I talk about, yes, I write romantic suspense as Selena Montgomery. Uh, but my new book, what Our Time Is Now, I, I don't want to talk about the book, but I do want to talk about a chapter where I talk about the census. As, it, as important as it is that we think of 2020 as the year to vote for the justice we want, for the recovery from COVID that we need, for the work that we need to do on the economy, we cannot forget the census. The census allocates mm. billions of, $1.5 trillion. But for black and brown communities, black folks in particular, we do not fill out the census and the money we need never shows up. The resources that we need for our communities do not show up. And we can't elect people because the lines are drawn to separate us so we never get to work with people who share our values. So if we want to be able to elect people who represent us, and if we want the resources to take care of our community, I need everyone to not only have a fair fight in our elections, but to push for a fair count in our census. And if you want to go to my organization, faircount.org, the census is critical. 
Black families stand to lose $3.3 billion, Latinos $4.4 billion, people of color $8.2 billion if we don't get this right and we only get one shot at it. So we need folks to fill out the census. Faircount.org. Oh, no. Mm. Stacy, thank you for mm. adding that. Yeah. Most folks did not know that. I know I didn't. I want to be the first wait, ever panel. When you said most folks, you mean nobody. I did. <laughs> Stacy. Thank you for that. They didn't oh, know that mm. you wrote romance novels and the fact that we need to fill out the census so we can make sure we are counted and our funds are there for us, especially in this culture and our community. Stacey Abrams, you have a book out. Um, it is Our Time. Our Time is Now. Folks need to go check that out. Thank you for joining us. You have been a pleasure. And again, I like to see you be a running mate of someone's, but that's just none of my business right now, okay? Thanks for joining Thanks. us. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, you Stacy. She is awesome. Ain't awesome. she awesome? Okay, power voting. Stacey Abrams is killing it. Teach us, I mean, wasn't that an education? She's amazing. I Did you know that about the, the look? About the census? Absolutely I was about to say not. census, no, it's real good. Absolutely no. not. Census. To be educated. As black people, we need the education.